It's the Score North Twin Show. Thank God they canceled that game yesterday. I think I think everyone just needed a breather from Twins anemic <laughs> bats. Just it's not a total train wreck start to the season cuz I would say the Astros have had a total train wreck start to the season. Did they went they were like 2 and 7? Did they what was their deal yesterday? Let me check this out here. I think they You, lost you can't win they? a division in in uh, March and April, but you can certainly lose one. Is what yeah. the old ball heads will well, tell you. A train wreck is the White Sox too. Marlins. I mean, that's yeah, the Marlins. But the White, White Sox aren't like they're not competing for. I mean, like among teams that are oh, they're competing supposed to maybe be playoff I mean, teams. The White Sox are done already, and they're nine games in. They yeah, won Marlins, once. Marlins won a nine. Marlins have won once in ten games. Yeah, like the. Yeah, I mean, here you go. The, well, the Astros did win yesterday, so they're okay. now three and seven. So they've kind of salvaged it, but. That's what's tough. The one year that the Twins started 0-9, and they, they had playoff aspirations on paper going into the season, and then you yep. start 0-9, and, and your season is pretty much over. Yeah. Because now you have to play 40 games above 500 to get to nine to get to get 90 wins. <laughs> Seems so, reasonable. So if you can weather a bad start, and this is, this is by the way, your State of the Twins Monday edition of the Scorn Our Twin Show. Uh, our our resident beat podcaster Declan is pumping out the extra innings. Actually, let's let's flip this just on air production oh, meeting to that this was year. Because we, we don't we don't want Whoa, the extra happened? innings with fingers. Declan, the extra nope. innings with Declan to be you know confused with uh, the boy, main episode. Screw that up. No, I I had it and then I moved it and I probably just fat fingered my way my way <laughs> to it. So I, I know all about fat fingering. You can find wow. Putting the ing at the end of uh, that. I mean, on my keyboard. You, you, <laughs> look, are are we not all adults? We could have just moved on. We could have just we could have <laughs> yep. just not addressed yep. it and yep. just <laughs> let it sit in the ether and let people figure it out. Yep. But, but they now, it but are. now yep. it's out there. Twins baseball is on the air. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Well, we're live, Bert. <laughs> oh, we're live. Well, we're, live. we're gonna have to and do Tory that again. Tori Hunter, two for three. I'm Anthony gonna... Lapanta just wide eyed. <laughs> oh, we're live. Well, we're live. Yeah, we're uh, we're definitely live. So, okay, state of the twins. I'll give you the overview, and then I'll ask you guys a few key questions about this ball club. <laughs> twins are three and four on the season. The twins are in fourth place in the American League Central. They are. Uh, let's see how many games back they are right now. There are three games back of the Cleveland Guardians for first place. But the most important things here, and it's small sample size, the Twins are 27th in runs scored per game after one week of regular season baseball and 7th in runs allowed per game. So they're actually pitching like, I know they're pitching from behind a lot because their offense can't get going, but uh, the pitching has been less of a problem than getting runs across home plate. So, We'll start with Declan here, who's going to be on the scene. He's been at Target Field a lot the last few days, pumping out extra innings episodes. Score North Twin Show YouTube channel is live as well. Give me your favorite current Twins thing, despite this rough stretch here the last few days. Favorite current uh, Twins thing for me is is Carlos Correa. Carlos Correa is 100% healthy at the plate. We all know that his defense is good, but throughout the first week of the season, and by the way, with I know there was a rain out yesterday, but... The lack of games the Twins have just played compared to the rest of Major League Baseball is just frustrating to me. It's frustrating from a baseball fan. It's frustrating from someone who is very career and work routine oriented. Like, I want to get in a routine. I want to know there's a Twins game. And for the love of God, there's off days. There's rainouts. Just play some damn baseball. I don't need an off day every 48 hours built into the schedule. I understand opening days and how that works. But for God's sakes, other teams have played 10, 11 games. And here the Twins sit with seven games under their schedule. <laughs> and then everything's going to get really congested because you had a bunch of random off days to start the season in April. Dude, the Dodgers have played 12 games already. Yeah. The Dodgers are coming in here. They like, they started their season in in uh, South Korea, right? They're just they're bouncing around the world playing baseball. Crazy. But I will say, uh, back to the Correa after my side rant there, he is taking a ton of walks to play. He actually leads, even with just the seven games, leads baseball and on-base percentage. He's still the heartbeat of that team. Um, the thing I told Judd on opening day and, and what is kind of nice here is when, when Carlos Correa is hitting and he's healthy and he's someone that has been around everything and won World Series before, you can kind of lean on him. And even though the runs haven't come yet, and I'll have a note on that here a little bit on this State of the Twins episode, Having Correa in the lineup and fully healthy 
once everyone else kind of starts settling in a little bit more at the plate, man, that's dangerous. You're going to have one of the most dangerous cleanup hitters and guys who just can work a count as good as anyone and obviously still play fantastic defense. So my favorite thing throughout the week, throughout the first week of the season, would be Carlos Correa at the plate. Okay. Mine is the current, and it's sort of odd, but it's fun, the current triple streak, which stands at three games for Alex Kirloff, who I'm doesn't look it. like the most likely candidate to hit triples. Um, yeah. So he joins Rod Carew, makes perfect sense, right? Dan Gladden, yeah, Danny, nails of a player. Delman Young and Eddie Rosario is the only twins to triple in three consecutive games. I believe he goes for um, tying the big league record tonight against the Dodgers. I believe that uh, that's what I saw in the Star Tribune, that four consecutive games with triples, which is very odd, would tie the major league record. But that's my... And, and Kirloff, to me, despite the fact that he has been stranded, I think, in every one of those three times that he's tripled, Kirloff, to me, like seeing him, as we talked about last week, swing the bat like he is now. And, I mean, this is the first time in a long time where he looks comfortable because he's healthy. Yeah. Um, that to That is my favorite thing because, unfortunately, there are so few offensive things at the plate to get excited about. Kirloff reaching his potential, though, would definitely be a fantastic sign for him and this team. Yeah, I remember when I'm trying to think of other similar twins obscure streaks. I think it was Marty Cordova in it was it his rookie season or his second year where he hit a home run in like seven consecutive games. A home run. It was either six or seven consecutive games, and it was knocking on the door of the major league record. Yep. And now yeah, Kirloff is record. here with with his triples record potentially. And he does I don't think like he's going to flirt with Guzzi's 20 uh, triples no. in a season. But. Well, what's funny is he he would not be he if if you were to stick him in in a, a like a criminal lineup, right? And say, pick out the guy. Who did you see triple three consecutive times? Kirloff's sort of a stout guy. Like like I could see he's very, he's homers very slow in footed. three yeah. consecutive games, but I would not say that's the guy that's tripled in three consecutive games. Yeah. Like for Kirloff to get triples, I feel like the ball has to like rattle around somewhere or well, ricochet started. back over some. The, the one on on Saturday, the official score originally called what Dex a three base error, and yeah. then she changed it to give him the triple. Yeah, yeah and that didn't get changed to like two innings later. So technically, the Twins would have potentially been no hit going into the ninth inning if right? that was not changed. Yeah, and they still had. 10 runners in scoring position despite the one hit, which is also just incredible. Dude. And we'll def I'm guessing one of us will will get to that in the uh, the next category. But I think the th I agree with you guys. Kirloff and, and Correa are just great bright spots right now for this team in this lineup. I'm gonna go in a pitching direction for my current favorite twins thing. It's the bullpen. So just now a couple caveats here. Number one, very small sample size. We're talking seven games of a 162-game season. And also, the Twins have not exactly been putting their relievers in the highest leverage situations. They're trailing a lot. So despite those things, and despite a wave of injuries early on, like their best reliever is unavailable, Duran, right? And they've got probably three guys that would be in this bullpen right now that just aren't because of injuries. They are second as a bullpen in strikeout rate, first in as a bullpen in ERA through the first week and a half. And the Twins bullpen is averaging the sixth highest fastball velocity at 95.1 miles per hour without Duran and the second highest slider usage at 40% sliders among their pitch repertoire. Baseball. So they're executing, I think, what this front office likes to see, which is a lot of sliders, a lot of hard fastballs a lot of strikeouts, and as a result, they've limited the damage in the innings that they've been asked to. So now what does it look like when the bats get going and now it's like you're trying to protect a 4-2 to two lead against the Dodgers in the eighth inning? It gets, it gets a little bit tougher, but the bullpen has been less of a disaster than maybe we thought with all the injuries that came out of spring training. And they're going to get guys have started to kind of throw a little bit, the injured ones in Thielbar and Duran and Topa, so progress is being made there that those guys should be hopefully coming back soonish. Um, they're at least progressing well, which is a good sign. It's actually interesting because I think my least favorite thing, segues still from the bullpen, is we haven't been able to see high leverage situations. That's my least favorite thing. 
yeah. that we haven't been able to see Griffin Jacks, Brock Stewart basically do anything in high leverage yet. I mean, they've pitched once since last Saturday, March 30th in Kansas City. So these guys have just been sitting in the bullpen who are supposed to be, for right now, your top two firemen out of the bullpen. And they really haven't been able to throw because they haven't been asked to pitch in high leverage situations. So with Duran out, you knew that Jackson Stewart were probably going to be one and two. And you saw that in the first two games this season against the Royals. But since then, you had Stewart pitch on April 3rd in Milwaukee. Griffin Jacks pitched in the same game also on April 3rd. And that's it. They've just been kind of sitting there waiting for their chance because obviously Rocco's not going to burn them in a situation where maybe you're losing. And Jacks did get up in the bottom of the ninth in the event that that game was going to go to extra innings when the Twins tied it. But my least favorite thing is I want to see these guys deliver in high leverage situations. And we haven't been able to see it. It's having the fact they have been unsuccessful. We've only seen them pitch once in nine days. Yeah. So they're either not playing a game or they're trailing is the problem <laughs> yeah. last week. So yeah. so Jax got up on Saturday. He mm-hmm. sat down. And then did Jackson com- come in and, and get as many war- warm-ups as he wanted? But they said Jax was fine. I saw that on Twitter. It was a weird story. Uh, Well, yeah, Jackson... Uh, Jay Jackson, a lot Jay of Jacks Jackson. on the brain here. Yeah, Jay, Jay Jackson. Jackson pitched the ninth, and then Griffin Jacks once Correa, I believe, got to second, started stirring again because if the game got tied, obviously okay. they're going to bring in Jacks. So, and also, I mean, hell, these guys have to warm up and start doing stuff because they're not throwing the baseball. I mean, you can do simulated stuff, and you can start, yeah. you know, you can do stuff between games and all your practice times and whatnot. But yep. those guys just haven't been able to throw, and you can't just also not have a flamethrower like that and not throw a baseball for a week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Joe, what is the, the, the thing that's making you the most nervous or the your least favorite twins thing, I guess? So I'm going to go with something that, that is, I guess, a conscious decision between management and uh, Rocco as far as the lineup goes. That's Austin Martin rotting away on the bench. He's had three at-bats um, in four games. I don't think he's started yet. Um, and and what, it, what I couples with it, for me, and I'm assuming that this is not all Baldelli. I'm assuming this is the w- way that uh, the line of construction works is the reliance on Willie Castro, who's three for 23, four walks, 12 strikeouts. And I think he's a nice utility player. I think he belongs on this team. Um, but if Austin Martin's going to be here, play him at least more, at least give him a chance or get a slappy who we don't care about to just sit there like, like this doesn't do him in my opinion, it does him no good not to play. And if Castro was like an all-star or like fantastic, I'd be like, okay, I, I, I get that then, Yeah. but he's not. And, and dare I say that there seems to be something with guys with the last name C cave and Castro who get leaned on wow. like they deserve to be playing all the time. And it's like Willie Castro is probably best off in doses, not in a, not in a, okay, Royce Lewis is hurt. So kid, you're going to play or guy, you're going to play consistently. And if Austin Martin is not going to play, I prefer that, that he gets at bats in St. Paul. I just don't think this is a productive way to bring a player along. If you're going to give him at bats, awesome. If you're not, just get an old guy like me to sit there on the bench, chew and spit and watch baseball games. I don't know about comparing Willie Castro to Jake Cave. I feel like like Jake Cave was I'm I'm with you in part in that like last year Willie Castro because of his versatility had the fourth most played appearances of any Twins player. Yep. And some of that was just like injuries, what have you. But they do find a way because he can play a bunch of different positions. And, oh, you, you need a third baseman? Cool. Willie Castro. Oh, you need a center fielder? Cool. Oh, you need a left fielder? Right. You can kind of just put him wherever. He's a more productive player and a more valuable player than Jake Cave. Yes, he can play I'm, infield and outfield. He you know, stole 30 bases last year. Yeah, no question. I'm just saying the the reliance of players who probably should have roles, to me, is frustrating. But, yes, you're right. I was I was just trying to really throw a name out there. To inflame our public. Can we have Declan go in and just grill Rocco as to why Austin Martin <laughs> can't get a sniff at the plate? Guys, it does seem odd, right? It's I throw, I throw him in there. Throw him in there. Yeah. It's like, strange. I don't think it's productive. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually had Willie in the least cash, uh, least favorite thing category as well. 
you know, he struck out 12 times this year in, in 28 plate appearances. His OPS is 416. Again, very small sample size we're dealing with here. Right. And last year, I liked Willie Castro. You know, remember, we did a twin show when all those guys got on waivers from the Angels, and you guys said they should put a claim in Hunter Renfro. And I said, you know, I'm fine with Willie Castro. And I was fine with Willie Castro in that spot last year because he's defensive, really defensively, he was really good, was stealing bags for them. And he's good in that type of role where maybe he can be a utility guy. But if he's playing, starting too, by the way, not just playing, starting just about every single game, ah, I don't love that strategy. I think another thing with Castro is because he is a, um, a switch hitter, you can, you can sort of like mentally Mm -hmm. trick yourself into, Oh, he's a switch hitter. So you can kind of put him in either any, you can put him in a lineup against a left-handed pitcher, right-handed pitcher. You don't have to worry about maybe pinch hitting as often because he's a switch hitter. Get the platoon split, but his platoon splits are still below league average. He's not like a great hitter against left or right-handed pitching. So sometimes versatility, the, Nick Punto used to be a classic example back in the day where, oh, you can just put him anywhere. He's, he's, he's great. Wasn't he a switch hitter too? You could put him, because Alexi Casillo was a switch hitter. They've had a couple of these guys where it's yeah, like, oh man, Punto they can was, play but... four positions. Right. And they can, you can leave them in the lineup. Um, it'd be fun to, to see Austin Martin. My least favorite twins thing, let's get to it. The lack of production with runners in scoring position. So coming into today's games on this Monday, the Twins rank 29th in batting average with runners in scoring position. They're batting 125 with runners in scoring position. Yep. They also rank 29th in OPS with runners in scoring position. The only team worse than the Twins in either of these categories is Judd's favorite squad, the White Sox. Mm. Just a train wreck. Although Ozzie Guillen on the White Sox postgame show had a great quote yesterday. Who was it? Uh, was it Luis Robert? Who, who uh, he yeah, like strained something? Yeah, they've got two something. guys out. Jimenez and Robert are both hurt already. And uh, and yeah. Robert is like a pretty pretty built guy. He's very muscular. He's a big dude. And Ozzy Guillen said, back when I played, they used to say that you can't strain fat. These guys who are working out, putting all this muscle on, right? You can't you can't you can pull a muscle. You can't pull fat. But uh, yeah, the only team worse with runners in scoring position this year is the White Sox. This could change on a dime, by the way. Like, all of a sudden, you go on a barrage against the Dodgers and this early in the season. But just to illustrate the difference, so the Braves have played eight games. The Twins have played seven. So pretty comparable. The Braves are leading the major leagues with a 345 batting average and a 994 OPS with runners in scoring position. So they have 44 runs scored with runners in scoring position. The Twins have 18. So with you know, one week into the season, we're talking like multiple runs per game difference between yeah. the best offenses in baseball and the worst, in this case, the Twins, with runners in scoring position. Again, it could flip on a dime. We're dealing in small samples here. But um, that's why they're losing. Because <laughs> they, they can't hit a bloop to center field with a runner on second or third. You know, And you'd like to think because, I mean, the Twins have 72 at-bats in these seven games with runners in scoring position. So... You know, easy math there. You're getting 10 cracks a game with runners in scoring position. It's more than that, too, because it's it's 87 plate appearances. Plate appearances, right. And they've drawn walks, and I'll get to that something and that no one's talking about kind of thing because I I heard a really interesting comment from Rocco after the game on Saturday about that. But, like, the guards are also getting guys on base in a similar position, but they're hitting 329. Uh, the Rangers, similar similar thing. They're getting they have ninety four at bats in nine games. Runners in scoring position. They're hitting three nineteen. Yeah. You'd like to think a dam is gonna break here because it is honestly like I was my mind was blown on Saturday with the fact that they had two hits and they were zero for ten with runners in scoring position. Like if they didn't even get a guy to scoring position with two hits, you'd be like, oh okay, bats didn't work today. That was brutal. Yeah. No, you had numerous opportunities with runners in scoring position. Um, and maybe that just dovetails into the thing that, that no one's talking about here, where Rocco made the point that no matter what, this team's going to draw walks and we're going to take more patient at bats to a default. Now, the issue is with runners in scoring position, you haven't been able to hit. Teams kind of have a book on you. I think also the Twins hitters against sliders this year specifically, they're atrocious. This Twins offense cannot hit sliders very well. So now you have to kind of change your adjustment, right? 
Like you're getting on base. I'm not at a worldly number, by the way. In the AL, they're seventh, but still, there's a gap there, right? Where runners in scoring position, they're worse, but they're still getting on base, not league average, but better at it than you would think. So when does the dam break? And also from a hitting philosophy, when does that start to change? Because you are taking good at bats to a degree. You're getting on base. You're putting the members on on scoring position, but you just can't drive in the GD run, you know. And my windy fingers. Why is that? Well, why it's, is that? It's, in, again, go ahead, in, in their four defeats, they are 0 for 34 with runners in scoring position. They yeah. don't have a hit this season in their four losses. Yeah, and you're going to find that that's the case if you if you. It, it's like the NFL stat where teams that run the ball for 100 yards have this right. record. Well, yeah, because like obviously you're going to, and plus you're running the ball later in the game when you're winning you're going to lose games in which you go 0 for 10 with runners in scoring position. But I'll, I'll put a silver lining on this. Declan brought up the walk rates and the on base. The ability to get on base and move the chains is the driver of scoring runs. I know people think that slugging, both are important. But in the equation of scoring runs, getting guys on base is the most important thing. Avoiding outs, keeping chains moving. And it just stands to reason over the course of six months, if you're constantly putting guys on base, you will break through and score a lot of runs. In fact, if you look at like the last 25 World Series winners, very few of them are leading the league in home runs. Right. A lot of them are leading the league in on base percentage. But you bring up a really and and this is to me that this is the most in-depth, interesting point. And it's not a small sample size because it's a trend. And the trend was last year. I agree. Work counts. That's awesome. Get walks. But as we discussed last week, as long as human beings are behind the plate, this notion of spitting on pitches that are so close that you have to assume. And Saturday, Brennan Miller was terrible. And the calls on Walner that got Popkins tossed were unhittable pitches that were not strikes. Okay. The popper. But, Ju- <laughs> but Julian is the poster child for the problem. He yeah. does have a great eye. But he's literally costing his team runs and outs because he can. He is a good enough hitter that he would get hits if he would extend at, at bats. But he refuses to foul off pitches to keep his at bats alive to get hits. Somewhere until we get to an electronic strike zone at some point, somewhere along the line, the Twins have to identify. Okay, we want to draw walks. We can. I mean, you know, Cleveland did. I mean, C- Cookie Carrasco is the perfect nickname because cookie is cooked. Um, But if you could have extended at bats there and you could have given yourself, like, you know, this guy behind the plate sucks. It's it's not a surprise. You can't not, trust him. You, you can't, can't tr- exactly. You can't, you can't trust. It's, it's still a human being that you can't well, trust. And he's just not good at it. Like his day was, was embarrassingly bad. He missed 10 calls in the first four innings of that game. Nine went against the twins. Okay. Yeah. After four, yeah. can't you just say, you know what? We're going to have to change our approach here, gentlemen. So, so like, I understand the philosophy that Rocco is talking about and, and Declan is passing along, but I also think at some point in time, you're, you're proving a point by cutting off your own hand, basically. Right. But I think, I think you can, you can be more productive with runners in scoring position and, or with two strikes in some of these scenarios and not sacrifice your walk rate as a, as an offense. Like, there's nothing bad about leading the major leagues or being top five right. in drawing walks because it means you're putting guys on base. But situationally, I agree with what you're saying. Hey, there's a, this is where, like, sometimes Joe Maurer would get criticized where, hey, okay, there's a runner on second base. They're probably not going to give you perfect pitches to hit because first base is open. Right. And he would take that walk every time. And oftentimes it would set the table for, like, Morno, Kadire, Torrey Hunter. Now a double scores two, home run scores three. But there are certain situations where, hey, if there's a pitch that's pretty close and you can drive it somewhere, you should. You should or try to foul it off or something, right? Right. Keep the bat alive. uh, Judd, what's something else that people should be talking about with this club? Well, you know what? I've been picking on my guy, Walner, now for quite some time. And I do think he probably needs to, to go down at some point here and reset. But I'd like to shift across the outfield to the other corner. I'd like to shift to right field where Max Kepler is one for 20. And again, it's a small sample size, only is it? Because we saw this last year too. And then Kepler got red hot in the second half, phenomenal. And and I think he's probably still on this roster, on this team because of that, okay? 
but we're seeing some we're seeing a return to some of the same problems some of the same things with max and i just don't know how long you want to go through this these cycles of these ups and downs and there's been a lot of downs too since what 2019 so so walner i think needs a reset but i am in no way shape or form done with him like i think he's got certainly he's got the opportunity here to have a bright future and my guess on Kepler is they did try to move him and they found that the that the return on Polanco and Kepler was not what they expected. Yeah. But I also question if I just want to go through this again. And I mean he might have a great second half again. Boy. But you know, some consistency would certainly be be nice. And I just always keep coming back to does he really want to do this? I, I pulled his game log from last year just to see like when when did he finally start clicking? And it was like June twentieth. Yeah, almost July. He went on a little home run spree in the second half of June, and then he really he really picked it up in August and September. He was hot, but basically from the start of the season until June eighteenth, he was unplayable. And I'm kind of with you. I don't want to overreact to like the first week and a half when it's kind of cold and you're stopping and starting and there's there's a game today but not a game tomorrow. It's, it is tough to settle into a groove if you're these hitters, but it's something to watch that we literally saw Max Kepler for the first 3 months of last year get close to maybe being DFA'd and then he but then he carried the team for like 2 months on his back. So yep. It's definitely something to to keep an eye on. Before I give you my thing here that people should be talking more about if you're going to a Twins game, maybe you're coming in from out of town. Declan, what hotel should people have their eye on just down the street from Target Field? You should go to Element Hotel. Look at this great little rooftop here. You got a great that. option. Got a patio up there. They got a big, spacious room. It's a good staycation for a Twins game. Yeah, maybe you're coming in from out of town. Maybe you're a Dodgers fan and you, uh, you booked a room there. Good for you. If you're looking at the schedule and you're trying to figure out what games to go to and where the heck can I stay, highly recommend Element Hotel. It is just stumbling distance down from Target Field. Uh, They offer spacious extended stay hotel rooms. They have premium amenities. They have free Wi-Fi. They have fully equipped kitchens. And they're pet friendly. You can bring your dog. You can bring your dog to the Element Hotel too. So that's a big win as well for us three who love our pooches too. So if you want to bring your pooch, that's possible. You can go to Element Hotel in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, Go check out the Element Hotel in downtown Minneapolis. Shout out to them for sponsoring the Score North Twin Show. Maya Mackey's ears just perked up over here. Oh, we could go on Hotel? Get to go on a field trip. Hotel? Oh, we get to hop in the car. Oh, hello. Uh, a shout out to to our friends at uh, Nicolay Law. Nicolay Law is the official, exclusive personal injury law firm of the Score North Twin Show, and they need it right now because they got some key players on the on the shelf here. Maybe they should call our guy Russell Nicolay. Nicolaylaw.com, one eight five five Nicolay. They are proud to serve the Twin Cities community. Just your normal everyday folks that happen to have law degrees. Here to help you when an unexpected accident occurs. Again, it's one eight five five Nicolay and Nicolaylaw dot com. So the thing Baseball. I think people should be talking more about is the top of this rotation. Now I know Pablo's second start wasn't perfect, but he's still Pablo. Joe Ryan has looked as as Ron Gardenhire would say, he's throwing the living fire out of the ball. <laughs> Joe Ryan and and I, I'm going to throw it to Dex because I know he had a conversation with Joe Ryan in the bowels of target field, but um, the strikeouts are there. The velocity is there. And it kind of feels like Joe Ryan through two starts is looking like the pitcher that we thought he was going to be going into last season. So if he's elevating up to be a number two starter in your playoff rotation, pecking order, thinking, you know, five months down the road, that could be a huge win. Only two starts, but I think keep an eye on the top two guys in this rotation right now. They both look like they're going to be mainstays here. Yeah, the velocity up, I asked Joe about that because I was curious, and he happened to have a baseball at the podium, and then he was just like, oh, let me show you. Like, I've only, I've only asked a handful of questions in this locker room. I've asked, obviously, athletes questions before outside the Twins and whatnot being in press boxes. That was, like, legitimately the most detailed and dream scenario you ever want an athlete or a coach to give you from an answer. Um, and he basically went into very big detail, like, where he holds the ball on his – split on his uh, splitter and where he holds the ball on his sweeper. And the one mistake he made on Saturday was he had a sweeper, didn't sweep. And it stayed right in the middle of the plate. The backup catcher for the Guardians absolutely destroys the ball. 
And he knew immediately the fact when that thing came out, I was like, oh, crap. And it's one bad mistake. And people probably look at the three. Oh, God, he gave up a meatball. And that that's a problem. He was excellent outside of that again yep. on Saturday. So I think Joe Ryan on the top of the rotation with Pablo, these, this is awesome. This is a phenomenal one, too. And he ditched that splitter last year, and he's been using it a lot this year just because it wasn't as effective. And the velocity on that splitter last year was actually kind of where it is right now. He just kind of parked it. Now he's using it a lot more. Um, and yeah, if, if he's taking the a next step forward and you have a really solid one-two option, and I do have questions, obviously, a lot of people do about the back end of this rotation. That's justified. But man, it, it makes it makes life a lot easier, and it just you feel a lot better when you have a one-two option. And that's what the Twins had from Pablo into Sonny last year. And even though Sonny Gray's a loss, you probably still have a really good one-two option from Pablo Lopez into Joe Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Now the other three guys, we're going to need more than like, four and a four. third at some yeah. point but it's it's cold you're not gonna with, with paddock especially you know the dude's barely pitched in two years when it's Cheryl. 50 degrees or 43 degrees yeah. okay let's 80 he's not pitches. gonna be throwing six or seven not yet yeah i do agree with that so all right there's your score North twin show your state of the twins monday trevor ploof tuesday tomorrow and if you haven't already we just launched a month ago a brand new YouTube channel, the Scornorth Twin Show YouTube channel. You guys have us. What are we? Are we at 20, 2,400 followers, I want to say? Yeah, yeah. Declan's yeah. driving traffic. Uh, by the way, one more thing. Walker Jenkins injured his hamstring God. for four. What the hell is going on yeah. here? He's playing center field that's, on that's Friday night off. in Fort Myers. He injures his hamstring, and he hasn't played since. So the two... Most electric young players in this Brooks organization. Lee. Well, three because Royce Brooks Lewis, Lee. yeah, Walker Jenkins, dude, everyone's out right now. What the make it stop? What in the yeah? Make it stop. And as far as I can tell, it's all, you know, it's just fluky stuff. It's got nothing to do with like medical staff. No, that's the thing. It's like yeah, you'd, it would be more if there was a solution to it, or if you could just like replace somebody with somebody else that could do it better, but. Oh, it's yeah. Gonna, you're going to fire and your entire medical staff. I had like, forgotten J Jenkins had a quad problem in spring training, and I think they think this is part and parcel of that. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, Sorry to end with that, but I thought it's worth mentioning. Thing. No, it is. It is you know, it is. I mean, come on. It's a buzzkill. So keep an eye on uh, that rehab process. That probably any sort of sliver of hope that he would skyrocket through that takes care of it. two levels and maybe right. be here in like September, which right. I think that was a long shot to begin with. This probably puts an end to that. So yeah. And uh, if you're not following Declan, uh, he's at the ballpark on a regular basis. You can follow him on Twitter at Dex's tweets. Keep an eye out for the extra innings episode of the Scorner Twin show here. And we'll see you guys for Trevor Plouffe Tuesday tomorrow.